Good evening. Welcome. I'm John. I'm a bookseller at Literati Bookstore in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. We're so pleased to welcome Jennifer Michael Hecht and Maggie Smith in support of their recent titles, The Wonder Paradox, Embracing the Weirdness of Existence and the Poetry of Our Lives, and You Could Make This Place Beautiful, a memoir. Just a quick webinar overview for those of you who are just joining us. The chat is closed, but please keep your chat window open. I'll be sharing links to purchase books from Literati Bookstore throughout the event. The Q&A is also available to you this evening. So whenever you have a question, please feel free to submit it using the Q&A. And live transcription is available on your toolbar as well. If you're watching us later on YouTube, you can always find links to purchase books in the description directly below me. And you can click on the typewriter icon in the bottom corner of your screen to subscribe to our channel and to be kept up to date with all of our At Home with Literati events once they become available there. You can also shop for more books at literatibookstore.com to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. And if you live in Southeast Michigan or the Ann Arbor area, our doors are open to the public for in-store shopping. But most of all, we would just like to thank you for your attendance this evening or this morning or this afternoon or, or much later this evening, depending on where and when in the world you may be joining us. But without further ado, I'll introduce tonight's authors. Jennifer Michael Hecht, a historian and poet, is the award-winning and best-selling author of the histories Doubt, Stay, The Happiness Myth, and The End of the Soul. Her poetry books include Who Said, The Next Ancient World, and Funny. She earned her PhD in history from Columbia University and teaches in New York City. And Maggie Smith is the award-winning author of You Can Make This Place Beautiful, Good Bones, The Well Speaks of Its Own Poison, Lamp of the Body, and the national bestsellers Golden Rod and Keep Moving, Notes on Loss, Creativity, and Change. A 2011 a recipient of a Creative Writing Fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts, Smith has also received several individual excellence awards from the Ohio, Ar Ohio Arts Council, two Academy of American Poets Prizes, a Pushcart Prize, and fellowships from the Sustainable Arts Foundation and the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts. She has been published in the New York Times, the New Yorker, the Paris Review, Best American Poetry, and more. Please join me in welcoming Maggie Smith and Jennifer Michael Hecht into your living rooms. <laughs> Hi. Thanks, John. Hi. Hi, Jennifer. It's so good to be here with you. I um, was telling you before we started that I haven't um, encountered a more underlinable, dog earable, scribble in the margins, um, yes, 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 exclamation point book in a really long time. I just loved yeah. the wonder paradox. Thank you. And you know, I I I'm I read your book and now I'm listening to it on Audible. So big fan. <laughs> you you have my Midwestern voice in your ears, you poor thing. <laughs> That's great. You do a great job. <laughs> um, I wanted to, so this book, you had me at the very first sentence, which if people haven't read it yet, the very first sentence is, I didn't mean to write this book, which I loved. And I actually, I think I laughed out loud um, in that kind of familiar knowing way, because I know the feeling of uh, a project sort of hijacking its yeah. author. Right. Like you think you're, you think a poem is going one way and then it becomes something else. You think it's an essay and it decides to be a book or you think it's a story and it wants to be a novella. And so I thought um, just out of personal curiosity that you might talk a little bit about the genesis yeah. um, of the book and um, maybe how it how it snuck up on you. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh... You know, I, I can even in a way so, sort of start with the, the way that your book and my book both have um, a lot of sort of poetic quotes and things that bubble up from our readings. Um, and not, it doesn't mean obscurity, you know, things that a lot of people will catch, um, but with such a beautiful uh, swaying into that back history. And that's, mm -hmm. um, in a way, The Wonder Paradox is trying to create a, a, a sort of, um, poetic backlog for people who don't have, they don't have to read all the books to, to read a few poems and get some of that experience. Um, yeah, the, uh, the prologue was tricky to write because prologues are usually where you sort of speak 
in a little bit more candor. And I spoke with it so much candor. I spoke in so much my voice in the book. But yeah, when I thought about the prologue, I just wanted to say that um, I had started out with the idea of the introduction of the book being the whole book. I wanted <laughs> to say to people, um, look, we are, people often seem to feel uh, bereft, lonely, um, sort of outside of meaning with the loss of religion or the loss of certain kinds of traditional ideas about meaning. And because of my strange cross-discipline work, I, I had um, heard from people question after question. So I, I sort of accidentally became an atheist priest by writing <laughs> doubt a history. Um, I wrote it because it sort of grew out of my dissertation. It wasn't that I was, you know, a firebrand atheist at all. I just uh, had written a dissertation that called upon a history of atheism, which I couldn't find anywhere. So mm -hmm. I wrote it, you know, I couldn't find a good one. They were all too polemic arguing one way or another. So having written it, people invited me to go talk all over the country and uh, outside and, um, Afterwards, people asked me questions that were much more emotional and intimate than my presentation had been because they'd caught on to the idea that I was, am a, a non-believer in any kind of God or superstition, but I like ritual. I mm -hmm. like people. I like, and I believe that human beings find their way to interesting things. And so this book is more reading what people are already doing than telling them to do anything. I'm sort of saying a lot of us are going to a lot of rituals in our lives. And some people feel guilty and especially in the middle of the country where they're not running into these conversations in the open as much, um, they feel guilty and confused to be at a religious thing without believing. Um, and on the coasts more, they feel okay about it, but they don't feel much, <laughs> you know, they don't mm. feel much. They don't, you know, the holidays used to mean very specific things. Now they all mean family, right? But, but certain holidays meant shame and forgiveness. Certain holidays meant starting again. Certain holidays meant finding the light in darkness. And we need ways to get rid of shame. We shame is built into the human body in a way that's just not fair mm. and poetry has helped people through through time and religion has helped people so i really wanted to tell people that pretty much what they were doing was okay already but if we just awakened a little bit of a poetic idea so that where some people might say they have a spiritual life we can say we have a poetic life. You know, I say if, if the only two categories are religion and science, where do you put love? Oh. And love is real. So, and, and, and if we feel so alone, how could we feel so alone with 7 billion of us? There's a way in which we were, we have a hangover from the old way. I mean, I don't even believe in an abyss after death anymore because once you study a lot of religions and see Christianity is very much an outlier in giving an, an afterlife where people are still doing stuff, walking around being themselves. And so you really start to notice that the other religions, you know, many of the Eastern religions, people are just trying to get out of life. They're <laughs> trying to end it, right? Life after life after life, get me out eventually. So it really is a matter of perspective in a lot of ways. And, and you can see that the abyss is just an after effect from staring at heaven too long. And when we can sort of liberate ourselves and, and let go, we notice we don't fall because we're holding each other up and we always were. And I think all of that is in poetry. All of that is in your poetry. You write very you know, warm and life-giving poetry. Um, the poem that your, your good bones, that's, mm. that was so much what that was about, right? That was that we all, we went ahead and had children. I went ahead and had children knowing that this was a very problematic world. Yes. And, and that poem of yours really looks at that and says, we're all doing it. We're all trying to see the best in the world for our children. And also if you don't have children for just for hope. Oh my gosh. I, I go long. <laughs> no, I selfishly, I'm now just annoyed that I can't just sit and listen to you and write things down that I'm being called upon to be articulate and pull more out of you because really I just sort of want 
to like let all of that wash over me and take lots of notes. Um, I've been thinking so much about what poetry can offer us that we can't get elsewhere or or maybe can't isn't the word like aren't oh, yeah. getting or haven't figured out how to access i mean as someone who is also um not religious poetry is that sort of like secular you know quasi spiritual headspace for yeah. me you know yeah. like that's where i go that's the sort of like still quiet place where um, I don't even think it's comfort exactly. You know, I think after Good Bones went viral, every journalist asked me some version of the question, what, um, what is the role of art in difficult times? Mm, yeah. As if I'm supposed to know. Right, right. Um, I'm actually just a poet. So I hadn't right. really considered that I was like fulfilling a role in yeah. a difficult time, I was just writing a poem, but I think the wonder paradox speaks so beautifully to this, like, what do you, a well-made poem, a well-made poem can be an altar to weep on, you write. Yeah. Holy moly. I mean, just. And, and I think that poets um, and people who read a lot of poetry sort of accidentally adopt a poem or two that are that come to our minds when we're when we want to weep and we don't have an altar and we do mm. have something to commune with um but people who have who don't read a great deal of poetry have to do a little step for themselves that culture usually does for people most cultures really do hand people 12 to 20 poems in the form of prayers or education or song we have too many Right. We're just <laughs> flooded with lyrics and quotes. And but you, you need, as any poet knows, you need to repeat things um, in order to really know them. And and this book very much suggests pick a few poems and come back to them. And they will mean different things at different times, like visiting a different city shows you how you've grown. Uh, it's it's a, a very. Um, historically stable thing as what you were saying about poetry as an alternative to religion. Uh, if I included all the quotes from great poets who said something like that, even going back through history, mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of them because they would have been religious poets if they were religious. They, right. There are poets who wrote about God and they are religious poets, but most poets of the great poets seem to be saying to, to be as I'll quote you quoting Dickinson, out with lanterns looking for themselves. Yeah. And that's because there was no light already that was fully trustworthy. And so they had to go searching. And that's that's so much of what you see in, you know, Keats and Shelley and, you know, go back to Sappho and she's asking herself, why am I feeling this desire and sort of a who am I? Um, and so, yeah, with the... Uh, it's sort of similar in your book. Uh, you you ask yourself a lot of, um, and include us in the question of of what is memoir, where you say it's this is a, a how do you say it? Um, not a tell all, but a tell your mine. Yeah, a tell mine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And that and and but you don't leave it there. You sort of fish around throughout. And and the thing I kept having to to assign myself was to speak to just what you just said. What is it that we're actually looking for? What am I trying to send people to? Mm -hmm. And I think I had taken it a little for granted. We, we both teach, but we teach people who come to us mostly. Yes. We're not like teaching people we have to first convince to like poetry. No, no, we're preaching to the choir. Right. So, yeah. so thinking about, so how do I put that into words? And there were lots of different important things that started to come up when I started to look at that. For, for instance, just the idea that um, just the, the state of mind, um, we know from neuroscience and, and people knew through cultures, through different kinds of meditation, through history, that we have different states of mind. And even our suggestion when we, someone's got a quandary and we say sleep on it, we're, mm. we're saying, Human beings pass through, again, I'm going to quote you with your, your you have the um, 
dolls that Russian dolls that you you include all yourselves. I thought that was beautiful. I, I mentioned mm -hmm. it to my daughter because I do sometimes sort of make her melancholy by missing her past selves. Yeah, she knows it, you know, and I'll be yes. like, oh, I missed this one. But there she is. She's yeah. still here. And the rush, the dolls are all in there. Right. Um, so what was I saying? Uh, one thing is that that state of mind of of putting yourself in a state of mind where you're not grasping for the quick answers, where you're allowing um, your deeper consciousness to come in. And, and what happens is you can just hear yourself, right? Um, and you can't hear yourself in all this noise, especially with the cell phones and everything. I mean, I, uh, I'm a little older than you and I certainly grew up in a much more quiet world. Yes. And now the, the constant noise coming yep. from, and I'm the one doing it to myself, I'm scrolling, but the, the, the constant noise makes it so, well, for one thing, I think that asking for people to do long meditation in a world like this is almost asking too much, that historically meditations have been with poems. Mm. Think about the whole tradition of, of Christian meditation, Jewish meditation. We meditate on Psalms. We meditate on sometimes pretty secular uh, texts. But the idea is to be quiet for a minute and read something over that, as you said, has to be well-made, but poems are. Yeah, they That's are. We, we, we make them uh, well enough so that they can keep giving um, when, we, when we keep going back to them. And be durable. Yeah. Right. I, you said something that just now I'm like, okay, I have to think about this some more. You said there are too many poems and I thought, wait a minute. Okay. I, I think what you're saying is it's not that there are too many poems. It's that we don't have a shared grouping of them, you know, I and, and meant the lyrics in one. Yeah. Way. Yeah. We have tons okay. Of lyrics in our head where Got it. historically people would have well-made poems set to music a little bit more. Not that yes. I have thought about that exactly that way, but I think it's true. Um, I mean, I love that we have music and I love, I have tons of lyrics in my head and they do come to mind sometimes when I need them, but they, but they work with their music. Poetry is something that's trying just with the words to get to something true. Yeah. And, you know, I, I often say to get to transcendence, music is better than poetry. But after a great music, I still want to talk about it. There's the poetry. There it is. I need words yeah. at some point in my transcendent experience. Some of it, words, words aren't as good as music, right? We, I mean, if you wanted to blow someone away, the fastest way in some ways would be music. Would be music. But, yeah. But what do you, what are you experiencing? What just happened to you? And and we talk about that in poetry. We talk about changing states and we also just do it in ways that I try to explain. Every chapter in The Wonder Paradox has a little poetry lesson, which I just titled Poetry Lesson. You know, it's a weird moment where you don't know how to introduce um, sort of information in a book where you're talking uh, playfully and about yourself. But so I sort of put in each chapter just like, you know, on one of them talking about repetition and why poets do it. Um, in one place, I, I call it like science because it is, you are just trying the same thing over and over in slightly different ways and finding, finding out about it that way. I love that. I actually wrote down, I, I took so many notes from this book. I think the, the best reading I do is always with a pen. I don't know if you're like that too. If I, if I like a book, I, I might not have a pen in my hand right away, but if I, if within a couple of pages, if I'm in it, I need a pen because I'm going to be interacting. I'm now in the book. I'm part of the experience. I'm participating. And I wrote down in any human endeavor, repetition can be a form of, of investigation from, from your book. And I was thinking about that in regards to form and sort of what I tend to do. And actually, I was thinking about it in terms of my memoir and um, some of the sort of returns and refrains. Yes. That are absolutely, and I hadn't thought of the word investigation. Right. But they absolutely are that sort of like 
I've been thinking about it more as rumination and the sort of narrative shape of rumination being kind of a corkscrew or a coil where you're moving forward in time, right? But you're also kind of coming back around to some of the same ideas I like that. Yeah. over and over. And that just, you know, when you read something and you're like, that feels so true to my experience. Yeah. And, you know, um, in in this crazy list making world, uh, people often feel like the, the chore, is, the task is to read as many books as possible in life. But mm. great readers I know read the same books, books over, over and over. And over. <laughs> right? It's so Even true. Poems over and over. Yeah. And yeah. It's something that I don't think everybody knows. I don't think everybody realizes that a lot of people who read a lot are not collecting a list, though we might be a little bit, right? You, you think about the great books and you're like, how'd I miss that one? Um, I, I do like lists. Um, I'll look at them and see, you know, did I miss something? And sometimes it's like, gosh, I love all these books, but I've been avoiding these three for some reason. And then I read them and they're incredible, right? But you you set up barriers. But um, uh, yeah, the the idea that, that coming back to the same book over and over, I see that in a lot of uh, books about reading, you know, why I read kind of books that people say, yes, these 10 books I just keep coming back to, which um, yeah, it's, it's the idea that these things have tremendous depth that we come back because we know there's something more for us there. But also, yeah, I think what you were saying just now, I, I loved what you're saying about the coil and the only thing, the, one of the, the thing that that uh, that I'm, I would add is just, or that you, I'm just celebrating repetition in mm -hmm. a way that I think sometimes people forget to do. Yeah, I love, love it. it. We yes. love to see the thing we love over and over again. And sometimes we leave that out of a sort of sense of accomplishment, right? We're supposed to read all these different books. Well, the second reading is, is such a phenomenal different experience than the first. I think we all know that with movies, right? People yeah. watch the movie the second time and can't believe how many foreshadowings is in the beginning. And Whenever I go to do writing, you know, if I, if I want to go write at a coffee shop or something, and I'm a longhand writer, so I will take, you know, a tote bag of some canvas tote bag that I, I know I have, I might have 150 canvas tote bags as we all do from AWP, et cetera, et cetera. Every indie bookstore, I have to get a, in a canvas tote bag and I will grab a notebook, grab a pen, and I will go to my poetry bookshelf and grab a book or two that I know I can start to read and it will be a kind of revving of my own engine. Something about reading the beautiful sentences made by others or just, it might I might not even get two stanzas in right. to the first poem before I'm hearing a new sentence of my own. Like it has, it has somehow revved me up to yeah. go in my own direction. And it's almost, I could the same books are always doing that for me. And I'm getting new different poems out of looking at those same books for yeah. 25 years. Yeah, it's amazing, right? It um, is. And, and it's also amazing to me how um, we fall in love with certain poems. And, mm. and, and sometimes a friend says, that they love a poem in a book that we've read over and over. We just missed that, but we just never saw the wonderfulness of it. And that's another thing that, that I talk about in the book that it would be great if we all had had a clutch of poems the way many poetry readers already do. Yeah. But if, if everyone had a clutch of poems and I sort of suggest you choose at least some from world poetry because for one thing, if something gets into a world poetry anthology, it went through a lot of people's hands first. It it has some magic in it, and it, mm. and you can, if you stay with it, you will get some magic. I, I I think it's important to choose a few poems, and I don't think it's important that you choose very carefully. I think there are so many great poems that can put you in a contemplative state, can remind you many poems will remind you of the scale of the universe. Mm. The, the, there are billions of galaxies and some of them have trillions of stars. And we're in a medium sized one out in the arm flying around. And meanwhile, 
We know about neutrinos and quarks and, and there are flies that live for one day and birds that live longer than us. And you I have one that. in my office right now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh, you poor fly. This, this is your life right now. Right. Right. This is but, it. As, but as far as we know, it's having a great time and going at a different pace than us. Right. It's, it's perhaps hearing a really, really engaging conversation about That's poetry. It. I hope well, that it- I wanted to ask you because you're mentioning this clutch of poems. And so in The Wonder Paradox, you sort of are advocating for having a personal anthology of poetry. And it, it actually reminded me of, a, of a, a, an end of workshop assignment that um, Kathy Fagan, hmm. the, the brilliant Kathy Fagan, yes, gave to me um, when I was an MFA student <clears throat> many years ago. And it was to make a, I mean, I don't know if she called it a personal anthology, but I thought of it at the time as sort of a playlist or a mixtape yeah, of like yeah. my poems. Like these are the ones, you know, like we talk about like the desert island books or the desert island records. Like these are the ones that I need close. And if I had to jettison every other poem, these would be like the 10 or yeah. whatever it is. And it's funny if I think about what my 10 were when I was 23 or 24 and getting my MFA in poetry, there are at least five of them would still be on my 46 year old self. Yeah. Thinking about those nesting dolls. My, my anthology has shifted in some ways, just like my favorite songs have shifted through the years, but some of them are just stalwart keepers. And, and I think we, we, I think sometimes we fall in love with a poem somewhat randomly and then it's just ours and it's, mm. it's, you know, and, and that does suggest that we can, you know, those studies where you can fall in love with someone by staring in their eyes. I never thought of that until this minute, but it's a similar thing with a poem. If you can say, what is a poem that a lot of other people love and you can get to know it. Um, I, 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 in a way, this book started because I did notice that people read poetry at weddings and funerals now, and also at baby welcoming ceremonies at, to some degree, but at weddings and funerals, it's almost standard. And I, and I started to think that we could use poetry in contemplative, almost prayer-like ways. Um, I'm, I, I try to be careful to say that Poetry predates religion in, in, in my research, in my mind, you know, what we call poetry or religion is somewhat uh, subjective, right? Mm. But I'm certainly not saying that poetry can take the place of prayer. I'm just saying that lately in the Christian world, in a post-Christian world, that's the clearest way to say it because prayers were the, the way that we interacted with these things. But yeah, saying to people, a, a lot of times people will be embarrassed that they got their poem from a movie or from someone else's wedding. And I always say, don't waste that beautiful cultural capital that was made to make that poem so so affecting to us all. So there are many people who, who are thinking of Hannah and her sisters or four weddings and her funeral. Um, in her shoes, there are there are lots of uh, of of wonderful movies, sometimes made from wonderful novels, that revolve around a great poem that already exists, and people do fall in love with it, and then they feel bad, and and, and that's one of the points of the the wonder paradox that it's terrific if we have some in common, mm-hmm. whenever possible, let's have them in common. They become cultural liturgy, and. Um, that's a term that sort of existed, but meant different things. I'm uh, writing it down. Cultural liturgy. Yeah, it's, I mention it in the book. And, and yeah. I say, you know, that, that, that we make things sacred by holding them sacred. And once we hold things sacred, they can transport sacredness mm. with, with us. You know, if you have a penny in your pocket when you get married or jump out of an airplane, that's not an ordinary penny anymore. Right. And that's amazing. That's human. Yeah. It's beautiful and strange. And, and I think we all do better with more beautiful and strange in our lives. Um, Mostly I encourage people to do the rituals they grew up with, with the idea. I I invented the term, the interfaithless, 
Um, just because I was looking for a term to say the co-irreligionists, right? right? I wanted it to be a positive term because atheist uh, is so, like all the terms are so negative usually. They're about negation, right? right. But, but it's not, when I thought not what it the, is. The, the interfaith list, it just made me laugh too much. I kept trying to get rid of it, kept staying <laughs> in my head. And, and it's because the inter is what's important to me that, you know, I, after talks, even recently, right, a, a Wonder Paradox talk, I had this beautiful talk with a, a woman whose family was um, Hindu, and uh, she did puja ceremonies, but wasn't believing, you know, and she talked, she, she heard what I was saying, we were, we were talking about how beautiful it is that we can sort of feel each other out there, mm -hmm. trying to do something poetic and beautiful, trying to have rich community centered lives, doing these ceremonies to try to bring that about and feeling connected to the two to five people in any group of 10 who don't believe who are standing there saying the words anyway. And right. to just call attention to it. The rest of us are out here. We do love each other. There is a slight congregationalism that you can have that, that we do, human beings do we just do much better at kindness when we remind ourselves on a regular basis what we're in life for. Mm -hmm. And poetry does that for us, I think, too. Um, reminds us, well, I'll go back to your good, your good bones, you know, it reminds us of the bad and the good. Mm -hmm. And it lets us find joy and hope while holding misery. Well, you that's used the tricky to, you, part. <laughs> that's the tricky part. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, when we have that all figured out right i mean know. disney world will give you happiness but it's yeah. a much richer experience when when you when, when it's you authentic enjoy having really processed loss yeah yes agreed um you use the term non-believers and it actually made me think of it in a different way which is to say what i'm sure you have been asked this what do you do when someone tells you i just don't get poetry like it just like I, maybe someone even says I'm a reader like I love books I read novels all the time I have tried I have I just I can't find a way in well, I, I think um that many people through my life have mentioned to me that they loved their college poetry class Mm. but they don't read poetry anymore and they wish they did and they feel guilty or confused about it and it seems to me that that community part that conversation they were having in their college class that was the pleasure together, yeah and hearing someone else pull a symbol out that you didn't realize saying something and finding out no one else saw it um that relationship is very rich and poets like you and me do find a way to have these conversations with other poets and, and with poets through history, right? By reading. Um, and yeah, so um, that's a little bit something I tried to recreate in The Wonder Paradox. When I started, I had a lot of poems in every chapter. Um, you know, if I have to say one thing that I gained in the sort of eight years I was writing, it was the authority to choose one and say, we're going to just look at this. This is it. And to look at it carefully and playfully. And, and I, I read poetry in a very, um, uh, I read first for story. I trust that someone's trying to tell me a story mm. and I generally find it. Um, and then I also read line by line, trusting each separate line to be telling me something. And so if there's a sentence in three lines, I'm hearing four pieces of information, each line and the sentence. And I think we all are. I think we trained ourselves to. It's just something I, I thought of to explain to, to non-poetry readers. So in the book, I kind of try to recreate that poetry class where I'm inviting ideas and also giving them. But I, I can also say, uh, you know, people seem to like one poem. It's just, mm. it's just a lot to read a lot of poems. Um, and I think, yeah, at weddings and funerals, you see people incredibly moved and they come up and they ask for copies of the poem because, because a beautiful piece of writing was handed to them by someone who was incredibly moved in that moment. Mm. 
and had the context of either marriage or death. Um, a lot of people use uh, E. E. Cummings, I carry your heart, I carry it in my heart. Yes. Both for weddings and funerals. And that's remarkable mm. because it holds, how could a poem do that? Hold the hope of the future while being something that, that you could hear at a funeral and feel better too. And that richness, right? But in each case, it's been presented in a context. Now this poem is about my loss of this person. Now this poem is about my hope for these two people getting married. Um, again, it's I think, yeah, it's become sticky for them in that way. When when they're when they come uh, in in more context. And, I agree. I agree yeah. with that. And I, like, it's interesting that one thing that that I hear a lot, I mean, and, and not just about good bones, but just about other poems is I like this because I get it. And it's funny, I, the, the sort of like ex, uh, poetry as accessible is sometimes used as a kind of backhanded yep. compliment, right? I mean, it, it can carry a fair amount of snark depending on who's yeah. call. I, if certain people call you accessible, it's not a compliment. Yeah. In this country, if you get to be one of the top poets, the poets seem to stop respecting you somehow. Yeah. It's, it's not. Yeah. yeah. If a critic yeah. calls you accessible, it's actually not a compliment. Yeah. If a reader calls you accessible, it is. And it just makes me think about how much um, I was saying to someone recently, I'm like, if, if you had only heard one song, let's say, or five in your life, and you didn't like any of those songs, you know, what if they were all country and you don't like country music? Or what right. if they were all rap and you don't like rap? Or what if they were, you know, all Garth Brooks and you just didn't like Garth Brooks? If you'd only heard one to five Garth Brooks songs, sorry, Garth Brooks, I don't know why you're my example. <laughs> and, and you believed that was music, then you might think you don't like or get music. Yeah. But in fact, it's not even country music. It's not even representative of a type of music, let alone music as a whole. And it it just strikes me how the the sort of like resistance or people feeling kind of outside of poetry yeah. has so much to do, I think, with a lack of exposure to a wide variety right. of poems so and, and contemporary poems in particular. Right. I mean, if and, you were taught yeah. Frost, Dickinson, and Shakespeare at you 19. No, you right. might not have, you might not right. have something that sounds or like you or mirrors your experience. And then right. you don't have that penny in your pocket, right? right? It's not your thing. Right. Right. And that's, yeah, that's uh, something with my book, I was directly trying to do. So th there's a way in which my book is, um, yeah, it's didactic. It's trying to, um, to give an experience that I do believe that poetry readers tend to get to enrich that experience for poetry readers, but to create it for non-poetry readers. I mean, if you're not a big reader, what could be more wonderful than an experience that happens on one single page? Oh, thank you. That's how I am. I mean, the, the hilarious thing about trying to write a memoir for me, um, not much of it was hilarious to be fair, but the, <laughs> the funniest part for me was trying to wrap my head around something like a word count. Right. You know, yeah. if someone tells you uh, it's going to be probably 65,000 words and you're thinking, how many sonnets is that? Right. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Because that's not how I think. And and we were talking before. I'd love to hear you talk about this. And um, the idea of how much is extracted in the writing process, because I actually think I started out with 60 some thousand words in this book. And yeah. I ended up with 50 some thousand right. words because I'm a whittler. Yes. As I revise, yes. every time I'm looking at something, whether it's a poem, an essay, a book review, or a whole book project, my first question is, what can I remove? Yeah, that's how I do too. Um, yeah, I, I write really long for one thing. Yeah. Then I imagine, uh, well, in this book, because my other books have been history, or some of my other books have been history, you show up because you want to know the story, right? But here I wanted to... Well, I would just imagine trying to tell the story to my teens, mm. literally. And I you love know, that. how can you keep your teens interested and in, in the room? Don't tell them more than they need to understand your point. 
you can't go on forever. They won't stay. Um, they won't stay getting it. Um, and not that I was, you know, I wanted the book, I wanted to control my own love of detail um, and love of history. And yeah, I would write really long and then just say, what do you actually need to know? Um, mm. You know, in each chapter, I I start with a with a question story of somebody asking me something that um, or making a comment that made a difference. And then I, I go into a section called how religion helps. And and the thing is, religions help in different ways. So, you know, Christianity doesn't have any jump in a river and take your sins away, but other religions do. Right. So it was like partially I was reminding people um, Look, if you want to get rid of shame, religions all over the world tend to use fasting and water rituals, um, you know, and and the ritual, the doing matters. If your hands are dirty, you can't think about them clean. You mm. have to get up and wash them. And sometimes we we need to jump in a river. Somebody told us would take our sins away or play in the monsoon. Um the, the Hinduism puja ceremonies celebrate every tiny little first thing in a baby's life. And remember, that's during the early part of a marriage where you need things to look forward to, to keep you going, to keep the sense that you haven't finished celebrating with your wedding and now you're just old. You know, there's lots of different religions offer different things, but amazingly often in the same sort of vein. So I could very quickly say, um, here are some different things that religions do that really help people mm -hmm. um, to think about what they need, like, you know, the idea of go pray on it. Um, well, go meditate on something or why don't you take a walk on it? Um, we don't have similar things. The closest we have is sleep on it, which is effective and shows that we're thinking about these things. Um, you know, the wonder paradox, people often ask me what I mean by that. Yeah, what is the wonder paradox yeah. exactly? Yeah. Paradox, the word itself, just the dox is truth, right? And paradox, these two things sit next to each other and they are both true and they don't allow each other existence. They clash. Mm. Um, and so for me, you know, one of the primary paradoxes of being human is, is that the meat thinks. You know, <laughs> oh my gosh, but yeah. the meat thinks, and the meat has created all the sonatas and all the symphonies and all the books and, and the whole astounding modern world. This ball of gray goo, which doesn't even last very long, you get about 20 good 30, 40, 50 years of thinking well, then you pass it on to the next gray glob of goo from little dots you made on a paper. And this whole world, the wonder of consciousness doesn't go away with religion. To me, it seems like religion was trying to invoke the mm. wonder of consciousness, both how it comes out of sex and nowhereness. And then there's a person who isn't like you at all sometimes, just a human, and also how an incredibly complex, majestic human being just is yeah. gone when they're gone. And that, these are weird magic things. There are many more, uh, I talk about the paradoxes, um, but for me, the wonder paradox is that we're so full of awe, that mm -hmm. creatures that developed um, through evolution materially are so, so taken by the universe, that we're taken by that stripe of white in the sky and we figure out over millennia that it's our galaxy. Uh, you know, just, just our Consciousness is weirder than virgin birth. Mm. Virgin birth, I could sort of imagine, right? A couple of eggs get together. Maybe they try. But meat thinking, that's something else. Well, yeah. <laughs> and and you and I both have made it, made consciousnesses with our bodies, though we wouldn't yeah. know how to start with our minds. So the wonder paradox, and to my amazement, to my wonder, when my book came out, some other books about wonder and awe came out that were... Um, really scientifically based and I did not know anyone was doing this research yeah uh, some one of the books or at least you know one of the arguments I've seen that's been so amazing is how um an experience of awe and wonder can get you to the same sort of brain space that long meditation can 
and people are arguing for just get those moments of awe into your life. Don't think, oh, I've seen a sunset. You, you need to let yourself experience that. It does you good. And, and it and doesn't also, get old also. Like everyone is totally brand new. We, we call them beauty emergencies in our house. Right. And so my son, my daughter, we will all say, if anyone yells beauty emergency, we call them to the front windows, the back windows, the, and we all know to come because if you don't look out at the sunrise, say within about a minute or two, it's a completely different color. Yeah. Emergency. Yeah. And, and yeah, one of the books on awe made the point that it, it, it's highly likely that our first language was, whoa, you know, <laughs> what yeah. would we have said? We'd have pointed, we'd have screamed from scary things. And we sort of naturally go, wow, whoa. Yeah. That's in all cultures all around. People, scientists, you know, social scientists running around the globe. So this book came out and I was amazed to see that suddenly there was a, a scientific kind of basis for making sure that you get awe and wonder in your life, that it does you good, like eating vegetables, but it feels good too. I'm wondering like what it is about right now, the sort of like zeitgeist of wanting to look at those things. Like what, why now? Like why wonder now? Why awe now? I mean, I I have like, you know, definitely off the top of my head theories. (laughs) Yeah. of why we're craving this yeah. kind of immediacy of experience. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think we're even adding it to the emotions that we used to talk about facial expression, emotions, you know, disgust and fear. And, and now we think to all, but give me uh, one of your, give me one of your theories. I'm curious. Well, I, I do. I honestly, I think it might go back to that sort of everything all the time. This that is kind of deadening to yes. be quite honest, like there are, if you are getting constant news, for example, sort of like one of those dog shock collars, right? Where it's like, zzz, like whether it's on Twitter or you're getting an Apple update or someone's texting you something, there's a constant influx of um, more than more often than not alarming, disheartening, yes. enraging yeah. news. No, we, we, we've learned the algorithms like us outraged. Yeah. The algorithms know that we spend more time on a site when we're outraged. I yeah. read a bunch of these algorithm books and it's quite frightening. And I noticed it in myself that I'll get outraged about something that I can walk away from and not care about, or at least not feel that feeling that, oh, there's my issue and I've got to, you know, and, and we do have to struggle. I think that what you said is absolutely dead on right. We, we need quiet when only one thing's happening. We need beauty emergencies. Mm. I like that a lot. And yeah, the the idea that uh, right now we need moments of quiet anywhere we can get them. Um, I totally agree. You said you said sleep on it, and and I I think one of the pieces of advice I give my my writing students more often than anything has nothing to do actually with craft. It's take a walk. Yes. Walk on it is actually, I think the the like most common writing advice I give. And I, I often will say, leave your phone or just listen to music on it perhaps, or just leave it so that you're actually listening to bird song. Tell me that they get all their ideas in the shower without realizing that's the only place they don't take their phone. Oh, it's a magic, no, no, the shower is a magic portal of ideas. <laughs> okay, maybe, right, but you are, you're away from everything else. And yes. These, and it used to be you were away, you would wait on a bus stop if you forgot a book, that was time to think, but not yeah. anymore. No, now it's no. more input, input all the time. And and that's, you know, it's it's interesting to be talking to you about it because um, of the, the, the viral poem. But um, one of my pieces of advice, uh, you know, I, I say pick some poems from world poetry because it brings us all together. Yep. Pick some from modern poetry, partially because we do write from identity a lot of times. And there are people writing from all sorts of identities. Gorgeous poetry right now. We are. Don't you think we're in a, a high moment of amazing poetry? 
I can't, I can't even keep up. It's yeah, I mean, between like the, the things that are coming to my inbox from the slowdown, the Academy of American Poets, yeah. I, I'm constantly, before yeah. I even get out of bed in the morning, the yeah. first things I get on that little device that probably shouldn't be on my bedside table is yeah. poetry. Thank yeah. goodness. Right. Um, and, and I, I've learned that that's a little bit us because we signed on to these things, yeah. but I've also it was found wise. that the average person still sees at least a few poems a week. And I'm just telling them print one. If it moves you print it out and keep it and reread it. Cause that's the part we're not getting. We get awe, but we don't get, we don't, we don't stay with it because it's such a storm. We're not metabolizing it. John, you you like just materialized like a genie. We we do have one question from the audience, and 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 viewers are welcome to submit their questions for our authors this evening. And I don't mean to shift gears, but I think this does sort of dovetail with some of the things we're talking about. Yeah, uh, Jessica has a question for for Maggie. Jessica writes, I, I find the structure of your memoir to be particularly unique, and you kind of mentioned this through the conversation. But how did you go about deciding how to put together these various real life moments and stories together into a book? And has being mm. a poet influenced that process? Yes. I mean, I, I write, that's a great question. I write everything as a poet. I probably took a lot of walks while metabolizing this experience too and thinking about how, um, how to structure it. But really, I mean, I joked about thinking about how many sonnets would create um, a book length work, but I knew that entering this project, I would have to write it small over and over and over again. Um, I didn't think that it would be um, successful for, for me to try to write a linear, just really sort of like prose heavy book. I don't think that I could have been successful. And by successful, I mean, have written something that I was proud of. Um, and so I uh, wrote each little bit separately, just like I do a collection of poems. And then um, I printed the whole shebang and laid it out on the living room floor, just like I do with a collection of poems. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, we all do this, right? And and then I um, I borrowed some markers from my children and I color coded um, what you could probably discern are different threads or strands in the book, the questions, the italicized sections that are metaphor, um, the sort of flashbacks, uh, all of those, the quotes, all of those got a color. And then I worked on having sort of balance in the way that I moved from each of these things from the beginning to the end. So it was the, it was much more uh, an assembly project, like a book of poems, more than probably what someone might think writing a memoir would be like. Someone asked me, did you outline this? And I was like, are you kidding me? I haven't made an outline since probably eighth grade. I mean, no, I did not outline it. It was, it was very intuitive. Um, and I definitely slept on it a lot and walked on it a lot and, um, took a whole lot out during the process and wanted to use white space. to just let readers sit with things for a few minutes. I mean, isn't that the beauty of poems? Like everything you said about your book, I could say about each chapter. So the, the chapters in my book have a lot, each one has its own little threads that come back around. Yes. You, got, you just write and write and write and start to notice, oh, I seem to keep mentioning this. And then you bring it forward and a ton, a ton of trial and error. I love that. The, the one book I would recommend if people are are doing um, particularly life writing and they're thinking, I don't really know how to structure this thing. Um, Jane Allison's Meander Spiral Explode, which is this book about different narrative structures other than that like classic arc that we've all been taught in school. Such an incredible book. Um, and really, I think permission giving in a way, like, allowing you to think about different ways to build yeah, the thing I, you're trying to build. I'll add that there are some books that talk about um, 
female versions, not to say they're all about women protagonists, but a female version of Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, which is more uh. about making friends and and the feminine style hero. And he, he described uh, some some people have described Harry Potter as one of them, that you the more you make friends and get your friends to be your help, that that's the female uh, hero's journey. There are a couple collaboration. of collaboration talk about collaboration, more about about finding your people and and not the version where you become so weird and special that you're kind of always a, the lonely hero, oh. uh, which the other model has. So yeah, people are doing such interesting work about narrative form. Um, oh, and I think I they'll love study that. your book, hon. I really think your book has just such, um, one of the things that I'll, I love so much is just that you somehow manage so much narrative uh, push while being so poetic. So I just kept reading it till I got to the end. I mean, I read it until it was so late at night and then I went to sleep and, and finished it the next day. You slept um, on it. I slept on it, <laughs> but I did. I just kept reading, which, you know, in this world of movies and all the other things you could be doing. Yeah, um, no, that's such so a much compliment. Wisdom, so much wisdom and so much beauty, but also this narrative push that makes you want to keep reading and find out what happens. Um, congratulations on it. It really Goodness. is a beautiful piece of work. Thank you. Thank you. We just have one more question here. Um, Steph writes for, for Maggie, given your love of music and the pictures of my dress song, have you thought about trying to write songs or set your poems to music? No, although in the memoir, uh, spoiler alert, there's a little bit of, um, of a song um, that I seeded and sort of gave a metaphor to um, to Rhett Miller, and he he started writing a song sort of based on that idea, and then sent it back to me. So that's that's in the book that I'm more comfortable with the idea of being like, hey, I have this idea for a thing. Do you think you could make it? Because that's what you do. But I actually, still get pennies from uh, from the film from the songwriters guild because a bunch of different people have put some of my poems to music oh. I've never made any month but like one in sweden and very, i love unique. this but yeah and i wasn't planning them to be songs but but yeah it's quite an experience yeah yeah i mean i i think from what from what I understand and from what I can glean, the the structure of songwriting is just it has its own form and its own integrity, and it's a very different thing. Um, and so I I think I would have to to kind of wrap my head around that, and that's not that's not quite what I do. But I also have a um, my my secret belief is that all poets really would rather be um, rock stars. Um, but we're introverted. Well, it is most lyric of us. poetry, right? Yeah, a it liar. is lyric poetry. That's right. Things to a liar. That's yeah. So for those of us who are even too shy to do karaoke, we'll just stay on the page. But like, there is like a little. There's a little nested doll inside of me that's like, wow, wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> maybe our kids will start a band. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> um, I think that's a lovely note to to to. And on, uh, we're, we're reaching at the, the top of the hour here at At Home with Literati, but I do want to give you both a chance to just, I feel like I interrupted a very beautiful free-flowing conversation. So I, 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 I want to give you both the, the, the final word here before we sign off. Oh no, we, we would just sit here and talk for, you can just shut, you can just actually just go and then we'll just keep continue talking. Slowly. Yes. This is, it's like a game show where it's like, you know, book talk or happy hour. And it's really hard to tell. <laughs> This has been so lovely. Thanks, John and, and Jennifer. Thank you for your work and for being willing to talk to me about it. Oh, it's been so great. It's been really great. And and yeah, I think our two books actually complement each other so much because what I'm saying to people is read some poems and they will come to you when you need them. And in your book, they keep coming to you when you need them. And it's such Thank a goodness. Thing. Yeah. Thank you Thank both. You. And you, you can purchase The Wonder Paradox and you can make this place beautiful. There are links in the chat. There are links below if you're watching us later on YouTube. Jennifer Michael Hyde, Maggie Smith. So thank you so much again for joining us at At Home with Literati. We hope to have you in the store in the not too distant future for, for your next books or these books in paperback. Um, but until then, be well. And to all of our viewers, thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you at the next event. Take care, everybody. Have a great night. <laughs>